Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy R.N. Healthy You, Healthy Nation, Healthy World. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse. And this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And today we have a renowned physician who is going to be speaking with us, who I will introduce in a moment, Dr. Peter Coey. And our topic today is about healthcare reform, but a different kind of reform that you've been hearing about recently. We're going to be talking about med medical errors and tort reform. Justice at what price? And we're going to explain what tort reform is. We're going to explain to you what this means and the role that you as a consumer can play in this. But let me first introduce Dr. Coey, who we're very pleased to have. Dr. Coey and I worked together when I was working at Mainline Health, and I can tell you by reputation, he is very well thought of, not just here in Philadelphia, but he is really an internationally well-known person in his field. He is a professor of medicine and clinical pharmacology at Jefferson Medical College, and he is chief division of cardiovascular diseases at Mainline Health, and he resides at Lankanaw Hospital primarily. He also does uh, cardiovascular research at the Lankanaw Hospital and Medical Research Center, often referred to as Lemur. He is a graduate of St. Joseph's University and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. After that, he spent some time in the Boston area at the Harvard School of Public Health and at the Roxbury, uh, West Roxbury VA Hospital. So he is very, very well trained and over 30 years has really honed his skills to be a true expert. And I think that what Dr. Coey is going to be telling us about is his own personal work in this field of tort reform. So I want to welcome you, Dr. Coey. It's really a pleasure to see you again and to have you as our guest today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Nancy. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. So why don't we start out with tort law and tort reform, which, by the way, I noticed in your bio, you have three children, and they're all lawyers. So somehow this whole medical legal uh, issue is something that you feel very deeply about personally. Yeah, we, we, I'm kind of surrounded. I have two son-in-laws and my wife also. So uh, it, in terms of, uh, I can't tell too many lawyer jokes at Thanksgiving, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> but uh, it has given me an opportunity to learn a good deal about uh, the legal system. I don't pretend to be an attorney or know a whole lot about the legal system, but I do know, and, and I've done significant research on what's happening with regard to malpractice and the way that we handle litigation in that particular realm. And, I, and I, I'm sure that's what you'd like me to speak about. I would, and I would like you to tell us really both sides of the coin, because I think that it's natural for people to say, if a physician is talking about the legal side of malpractice, is it a defensive posture? I mean, do people deserve to, to have awards for malpractice? And I think, again, for our audience, explain tort law a little bit and what tort reform entails. And if you could pull that all together, we'd be most appreciative. Well, that's a, that's a, a, a good task, and, and I'll, I'll take it on. But uh, I'll make sure that we have plenty of time for you to ask clarifying questions as well, because it is a complex area. Um, everyone knows that uh, when we deal with biological systems, things uh, may go wrong. And when they do, there's no question uh, that patients should be able to recover some for some of the damages that occur uh, because they need sometimes ongoing care for some of the things that might happen if they have uh, something, an infection, or they have something that goes wrong with a joint or some kind of an operation and they require a long period of recovery. Uh, they, they deserve some economic recovery. People who have had loved ones die in cases where there's been a mistake clearly deserve to have some kind of an award. The problem in the United States is that there's no mechanism to do that other than suing the doctor. So in essence, the only way that you can recover from a case where you think that there's been do harm done is to take the doctor to the court, to a civil court, and recover through a verdict, either from a judge or from a jury, that uh, allows you to get some kind of a financial remuneration for the damages. Um, the legal system is such that in order to be able to recover, the plaintiff or the person bringing the case has to prove not only that there was a mistake, but that there was actually negligence and carelessness on the part of the physician. That's the legal standard. 
So mm -hmm. a physician who walks into a courtroom after having had something bad happen to their patient and having the family bring a uh, suit is sub subjected to a lot of verbiage and language in the courtroom that makes that physician sound like they're pretty darn uneducated and uncaring and uh, incompetent. Mm -hmm. That process uh, is very damaging to physicians. As you can imagine, uh, a person who has uh, gone through that kind of an experience or who, ha who knows someone very well who has gone through that experience becomes very defensive in their posture. And that we think, and we know in fact, we've proven that physicians who have that kind of an attitude tend to be then begin to order lots of extra tests and procedures in order to protect themselves. This mm -hmm. is the term that's been used for this is defensive medicine. I don't think anybody argues that defensive medicine occurs. The argument that has, that has raged is how pervasive is it and how much of our healthcare dollar is spent on the needless kind of testing that all of this has engendered. Mm -hmm. The GAO, the, the Government Accounting Office, has estimated somewhere between 2 and 3 percent of the healthcare dollar is spent on defensive medicine. Those of us in the field uh, who know wh what happens in real medicine think that they're probably off by an order of magnitude. We think it's somewhere around 30 percent of the tests that are ordered by doctors are potentially unnecessary. And how do we know that? Well, some of it is surveys. So we go to physicians and ask them. Some of it is actual monitoring of physician behavior. But uh, a number of different surveys, I think this number of about 20 or 30 percent keeps coming back, and we think that's probably mm -hmm. the best estimate. So if you think about how much money we're spending in this country on medical care, spending an extra 30 percent on tests that are being carried out because doctors really are afraid of being sued, uh, doesn't seem like a very good bargain at all. Well, let, let's just go back to your first premise, like you said, with the law, the way, the way it is conducted. There has to be someone at fault. Is that the bottom line? Yes. You there have has to, to be some, some fault finding in some way so that you could then have the claim for then getting the financial benefit of, of some kind of settlement. That's correct. There has to be some proof that someone, exactly as you said, performed uh, their care negli and the, the term that's been th that is used as a legal standard is negligence. There needs to be negligence proven, not just that there's a mistake. A mistake is okay if it happens and no one's no one's responsible for it. But if you need to be able to prove that the doctor was negligent in the way that they conducted themselves. Well, let's, let's, can you give us an example of a mistake that would be made that would be not anyone's fault per se? Well, there's, there's a lot of things that happen in medicine, as you, as you well know, Nancy, that you, and I know that you, you have tremendous experience in this field. There's things that happen in medicine that are unforeseen, and uh, the, the term mistake is probably a little bit harsh. It's something that happens within the course of a procedure that is a known complication of the procedure and yet leads to a very bad outcome. An example is a doctor who puts a catheter inside somebody's heart and is attempting to open up a blocked artery with a balloon, mm -hmm. uh, the balloon can burst or the artery can close and the person can actually have a heart attack because of that and damage the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. That can lead to lots of disability and even death. That's, uh, that's an unforeseen, uh, a foreseen but un, uh, un, unaccounted for outcome. It's not because the doctor did anything wrong, it's just in the course of the procedure. Right. So it's a complication. It's a complication. Rather than a mistake. Rather than a mistake. A mistake, a mistake sounds a little bit more harsh. For example, taking off the wrong leg in a surgical procedure. That's I would say that's a large mistake. That's a large mistake. Mm -hmm. But you know, what's incredible is that it does occur, even though there are lots of safeguards within the hospital system. Those things still happen. And there's no one's arguing that under those circumstances that the person who has that happen to them deserves to be mm -hmm. rewarded in some fashion for the care that they're going to need because of the mistake that was made by the physician. So a mistake is not necessarily a negligent mistake, but it does rise to a much higher standard, mm -hmm. I think. So you're saying that it's something that was a complication and just walking backwards for our uh, listeners, Often, when you're going for these procedures, if you've had them, you know this very well, you're looking at an informed consent form. I mean, you get a whole package of materials, you're asked to read them, you can ask for interpretation if you don't understand something, and then you're asked to sign it. 
So you're saying in a case like that, a person could sign the informed consent. They could then have an untoward, unhappy outcome. It would not be anyone's necessary mistake, but they cannot really get any compensation unless they turn it into a mistake. Yeah, that that's uh, they have to be they have to petition and bring a suit. Now, not obviously not all lawsuits necessarily go to court. So if it's a very meritorious position that they have, if there was if there is really evidence and it's very obvious that their doctor didn't do something that they were supposed to do, uh, there's always the opportunity to settle the case before mm -hmm. it gets to the court. I mean, in mm -hmm. fact, in the current environment, I would say that we settle a large, much, much larger percentage of cases than ever get to the courtroom. And that's mm -hmm. good right. because it saves a lot of court costs and right. a lot of the tragedy that occurs in the courtroom. But sometimes, unfortunately, the re these disputes can't be resolved in any other way, and they enter into this uh, th into this amazingly arcane system we call the tort system. Mm -hmm. And what are the factors that really push people over to the edge of not wanting to settle and wanting to take it to court? Well, it happens. At, well, there's there's both sides have to uh, have to be uh, aggrieved sufficiently. So on the patient side, it's usually anger, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that anger, by the way, comes because doctors. Don't sit down and talk to patients. There's a number of new programs in this country, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard about these, uh, called the, the conversation method where the, the aggrieved party, the plaintiff, is allowed to sit down with the doctor in a room and ask all the questions and let, give the doctor a chance to apologize and to explain what happened. And uh, there's a system like, uh, that's uh, very much in play like this uh, at Drexel now in Philadelphia. There's also University of Michigan. And what we've learned is that you drastically reduce the number mm -hmm. of cases that actually go to suit. Um, people don't really want the economic damage. The, the money's never going to make up for a lost loved one. All they really want to know is what truly happened, and they want to hear the doctor explain it, and if, if appropriate, apologize. Right. So that is a very, very good system right. uh, of dealing with some of these uh, controversies. On the doctor's side, the doctor so frequently will not settle a case because the doctor is completely convinced that they didn't do anything wrong, that they... They did everything exactly the way that they should have, and it, as you said earlier, they just it led to a bad outcome, and unfortunately harmed the patient. Mm -hmm. I just want to make that point uh, and underscore the point that Dr. Coey just made in terms of communication. It is so vitally important, and that's part of the reason we're having these conversations. And this show is dedicated f for having those kind of understandings, so that you would know that you can have that kind of conversation. You can ask for it. You don't even have to wait for it. Obviously, in something that is as serious as loss of function or loss of life, I mean, obviously, you want as much information as possible. And you're saying that when those uh, conversations occur, it doesn't mean that it won't go to court, but it means that people will have a better understanding. Yeah, just as an exa example, a good illustration of that is we know that if, if you have been taken care of by a physician that you trust mm -hmm. over a long period of time, the likelihood of that physician, of you suing that physician, is virtually zero, mm -hmm. even if there's a bad outcome. Why? Because you've established a relationship, and it's very easy for you to go and talk to that physician and say, you know, and it's easy for that physician who knows you very well to be honest with you and explain exactly what happened. The cases, the, the, the real high hazard cases are things like an emergency room. So think mm -hmm. about this. If mm -hmm. patient rolls into the emergency room, they've never seen this physician, the physician doesn't know the patient, something bad happens because of the lack of familiarity, and then there's this, there's no communication because they don't know each other. What makes it even worse, Nancy, is that once a suit goes in, the doctor's told, do not talk to the defendant under any circumstances. So even if the doctor wanted to talk to the mm -hmm. defendant, they're instructed not to. So you erect a barrier between right. the defendant and the plaintiff that just makes everybody much more angry right. and defensive. So you have to have those conversations early yes. because there is a period, if you make that move, where really you've cut that off. You've cut off, you've cut off any lines of communication, any chance of resolving it other than mm -hmm. through this mm -hmm. tour system. Well, Dr. Coey is so passionate about this subject uh, that he's actually taken it upon himself to write several books. And we're going to talk about this uh, first book that I read recently, Lethal Rhythm. And it's, it's a real page turner, I'm telling you. Um, it's a murder mystery-like, but I was wondering, how much of this is biographical? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say that I did recognize a few people in here, but what really sort of led you to do this? Well, I, I was, uh, first of all, the answer to your question is, I think all novelists have some degree of autobiography when, in their true. books. And so it, there is a little bit of me in the, fr in the, in the protagonist. But 
I was a defense expert in a, in a very complicated ma medical malpractice case in Philadelphia, actually, uh, defending a physician, and it really was a very good defense case because the doctor uh, was taking care of a very young woman who had had a very bad outcome, and he hadn't really done anything wrong, but she died suddenly, and, it would, and she had ch young children, and it was a very emotional case. And uh, I was sitting in the courtroom listening to the testimony and becoming progressively more angry about the fact that this whole thing was happening and, and that it was in front of a, a jury that probably didn't really completely understand the science because it was complicated, but understood the human drama of the case. And I was very concerned that this was going to go the wrong way, which it didn't, by the way. Uh, the good news is that we won that case. But, but uh, in the course of listening to all the testimony, I was becoming progressively more angry. And my wife always tells me, my, my wife's my best friend, and my counselor says, whenever you get angry, try to look for a way of an outlet because it doesn't do you any good to sit there and be angry. And I couldn't do anything else. I just was sitting in the courtroom. So I, I took out a piece of paper and I started sketching a story about mm -hmm. this because I really wanted to tell the story to the public of what it's like to be a doctor in a malpractice case. I mean, you can't possibly know that unless you've gone through it. And uh, it is a very dramatic thing. And uh, so I started outlining and writing Lethal Rhythm in the courtroom that day, and it turned into a bit of a passion. And uh, I just kept writing and finally was able to produce a novel and even more miraculously get it published. <laughs> well, that's a great way of channeling your anger. <laughs> I think most people in their situation like that start thinking of their shopping list and how am I going to get out of here. And Dr. Coey decides, I think I'll write a book. Um, so I think that what I enjoyed about it is it is very readable. It, you don't have to be a medical professional to understand the language. He's brought it down to earth. And it is very interesting in terms of giving you a flavor for how things work inside the healthcare system and how quickly people have to make decisions. And in this case, uh, the actor in the book, uh, the main physician who um, uh, was really taking some risks, felt he was doing the right thing for the patient, even though technically speaking, because this was an experimental intervention, in that split second, he didn't have time to get informed consent. He thought he was doing the right thing. And then that was one of those gotchas in the case. Does that happen in real life? Yes. Uh, the, 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 another thing that I wanted, the, you hit right on a very important point, Nancy. It really was a very important point of the book. The other thing that I wanted people to be able to do was to climb inside the head of a doctor uh, in the middle of this, this drama of patient care and under, uh, try to get some feeling for what it's like to be walking into an emergency department, as uh, Dr. Sarkis did in the book and be confronted with this disaster and realize that there were they were, he was going to have to take some extraordinary measures and try to weigh in his mind what the benefits and the risks might be of taking these measures. And the, at the end of the day, uh, after all is said and done and we strip everything else away, what most good doctors do is think about what's best for the patient. What is best for this individual at this particular time? And sometimes uh, those measures are pretty extraordinary, and sometimes they're very unconventional. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it is very important for the public to understand that the best physicians always have that squarely in their mind. What, oh, the, the only thing that I really care about right now is that I need to make this patient better. Mm -hmm. And in the book, as you remember, the, the woman in the emergency department was in the middle of a cardiac arrest, and although she eventually died, he was, uh, the doctor was successful in taking those extraordinary measures in the emergency department. Right, right. He was able to stabilize her, but you're going to have to read the book <laughs> to find out why she died. It's not immediately apparent as to why. Um, well, in terms of your practice, since you wrote this book, how did your colleagues um, respond to this? I've, I've learned a tremendous amount, Nancy, about uh, the business, of course, of publishing, but I've also learned a tremendous amount about people in the process of writing these books. I, I have to say, honestly, I never thought, I, I never, I, I never in a million years uh, anticipated how much I've learned mm -hmm. uh, from this experience. And part of the experience is sitting down with colleagues and patients mm -hmm. uh, who read, uh, all of my patients, pretty much all of them have read the books, and we have a, almost have a little journal club when they come into the office for their visits. <laughs> But getting their insights mm -hmm. from what they took from the book is extraordinary. Such and as? Give us a couple examples um, of that. I'll give you a really good example because okay. you, you happen to be one of my role models because you're an extraordinarily strong woman uh, with a career and a, a very accomplished person. And I've had a number of women say to me, 
do you realize how strong the women were in your book? Uh, if you think about the characters in the book, each and every person in the book, and s some of them were attorneys and some were uh, doctors, mm -hmm. each one of them was an extraordinarily strong person. And I didn't even know I did that. Uh, I learned about myself, my attitude about women through what people told me I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, I think that comes because, as you mentioned earlier, I have three daughters. They're all very accomplished people, and my wife's a very accomplished person. I think I've, su I've been surrounded right. by women like right. that. And I admire people like that, like you. And um, that's one thing I've learned about myself, just from my own writing. Uh, I've also learned a good deal about uh, the way that doctors uh, perceive their patients. Mm -hmm. And a number of physicians have come to me and said that uh, then several of the characters in the book were really, they really resonated because they were so intensely involved in their patient care uh, that uh, they, they could understand how they got, mm -hmm. they, they could understand how they got there and what it meant to them. So I, I've learned a tremendous amount about um, other people through the, the writing of this book. Well, thank you, Dr. Coey. I think that's really great. First of all, thank you for the compliment. Uh, but I think that by surrounding yourself with strong women, you're obviously going to you know, have that perception. But I think another theme that we're talking about in our shows is really teamwork. And so often you hear about you know, physician-nurse relationships being not, not as good as you know, we'd like them to be. But I think that Dr. Coey's comment is really a very, very important one. It's a little bit of a sidebar to our, our topic today, but I think strong, capable physicians, strong, capable nurses have a great rapport with one another. I think there's a great deal of opportunity to strengthen that even more. And with healthcare reform, we're going to be spending more time in team teamwork. No question about it. Uh, it's it's been one of the pleasures of my career is seeing that develop mm -hmm. um, from a model when I started out several years over 30 years ago, where the nurses were subservient, and now have really risen to becoming partners in mm -hmm. patient care offering their perspectives. I, I work very closely with Liz White, who's one of my nurse practitioners, at, uh, and uh, she's just extraordinary. I mm -hmm. mean, she does just a wonderful job, but she comp we complement each other. So uh, what she doesn't know and some of the theoretical aspects I, I help her with and some of the things that she really knows about the patients, because right. I don't have the time to right. learn. So I think the teamwork approach really is very important. I'm sure we'll see that reflected in one of your next books, <laughs> Dr. Coey. So be sure to write that in. Uh, absolutely. All right, back to our subject of, um, of tort reform. Dr. Coey was really schooling me in the fact that other countries handle this differently. And I thought it'd be very interesting for us to know from our culture, we take this very somewhat combative approach. Uh, of course, that you could say, if you're the patient, you're not feeling as combative because you're just looking for a settlement. But what we'd like to know is how do other countries deal with this, and is it better or worse? Well, I, 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 again, as you said in the very beginning, obviously we have our own biases. I think it's better because it's less confrontational. So in most of the European countries, there are tribunals that are available where cases where, in which a family or a patient believes that there's been a problem the case can be brought to a tribunal and within a period of just a few weeks, not one of the other tortures, by the way, of our mm -hmm. malpractice system here in this country is it can go mm -hmm. on for years right. before it's resolved. But there within a matter of weeks to months, uh, it's brought to a tribunal. The tribunal reviews the case and makes economic award based on what their belief is without blaming anybody. The other thing that they do, which I think we don't do and we should be doing, is if a physician is brought up to that tribunal for multiple cases, uh, in a relatively short period of time, so two or three cases within a few years for a physician, the tribunal begins to consider what the physician's problems are right. and tries to re remediate those. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously this is, could be a systemic problem and, uh, and we don't really have that in this country. It doesn't, there's no mechanism other than the medical societies, but they really don't really get that job done very well. So I think this idea of economic awards based on the merit of the case without blame is, is very useful as long as there's some policing of the profession at the same time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, uh, that I would wonder about, you know, sort of what's behind our, our approach is that in this country, the medical establishment is so powerful that the average person could feel like they could hardly get a word in edgewise if they didn't get a lawyer to, uh, to represent them. I mean, we're not talking about the cases where you said earlier where people sit down they have a trusting conversation. They make 
they make decisions based on information and a sense that there is real interest in, in trying to make this right. A lot of people, as you said, either don't have those conversations, are very angry um, or scared, and they feel that they have to get an attorney. Um, do you see that we will work ourselves out of this in some way? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, unfortunately, it's been left to the states. Um, as you know, uh, Obamacare really didn't do anything with tort reform. No. They, 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 they have a very token amount of money put aside for for a few projects, but there's really, nobody really has taken this on. So it's been left to the states to decide what to do. And unfortunately, we don't haven't had a whole lot of movement. The best that we've seen are, are a thing called caps on economic or non-economic damages. So when you when a doctor is sued, uh, there's two parts of the re recovery. One is for whatever whatever economic damages, mm -hmm. so lost wages and medical care costs and those kinds of things. And then there's this thing called pain and suffering. How much should the patient receive because they suffered pain and, and all the other things that go with these cases? Um, states like Texas, for example, have put a cap on the amount of non-economic damages, so there's not as much of a motivation to go after physicians in that state as there are in other states, and they've seen a pretty dramatic reduction in the number of cases in that state. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to go much deeper than that. I think we need to get these cases out of the civil court system into tribunals and have this done in a much more expeditious and fair fashion. Now, those tribunals will contain lawyers and judges, and I mean, there has to be a legal proceeding, but I think it needs to be taken out of the realm of, uh, you did something wrong, no, I didn't do something wrong, and, and a lot of that aggravation that goes with it. So maybe the analogy is just as in divorce, where some people have moved to a different um, structure, a more deliberate discussion, not taking it through the legal system, maybe this would be another pathway for this for this issue. Yeah, I think so. I, I think it would be very useful to it, so the no fault kind of situation. But we have to be careful with that because there are physicians who are incompetent. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are every, in every profession, there right. are some people who just don't do what they're supposed to do. I mean, we've seen this horrific case in Philadelphia played out in the press over the last several months. The most horrific part of that case, as far as I'm concerned, is. Where, where was everybody? Where, how did this have to go on for so long before? We have to have a criminal child in order to get this guy stopped. So clearly the profession has to do a better job of policing itself. Right. Um, there's no question about that. But if we, if we can do that and at the same time uh, get these cases settled faster, I think we'll all be better off for it. Well, Dr. Cohey, in closing on this really, really interesting topic that we could spend a lot of time on, but this is just the first, you know, blush at really understanding this very complicated issue. What would you have our, our audience do? I mean, what do you think the public can do to get involved in this? Hopefully not in a direct way, yeah, yeah. in an indirect yeah, in way. In an indirect way. Well, in a more, most important way is to have discussions as best you can with legislators and people who make the laws, especially at the state level, because that's where most of the changes need to come from at this point. But I think uh, making a plea to these people to work harder to bring us uh, reform so that we can do our jobs better. Um, and, there, and why? I think, Nancy, the, the, biggest, the biggest reason is because we really need to improve the quality of our patient care. Uh, ordering unnecessary tests and doing unnecessary procedures is just terribly detrimental not only because of the economic implications mm -hmm. and how much they cost, but also because you're putting patients through things that they really don't need. They, and when people are told that you need to have tests and procedures, it causes a great deal of anxiety, and, and there's, there's so much emotional energy that's being spent on this. So I think it's just, it's just good for everybody if we could get to a better place with this. And it's not going to be perfect. Nothing's going to be perfect, but I think we need to improve. The good news, Nancy, is that I think we are improving. I think things are getting a bit better than they've, than they've been, so there's some encouraging information, but we still have a way to go. Well, I just want to thank you, Dr. Cohen, not only for being with us today, but for taking this on as your personal uh, interest area and writing this book, Lethal Rhythm, and the uh, sequel to that is Deadly Rhythm. So there are two books. Maybe we can have you come back and, and you can do the, the next step with us. But I think the first step was today and really helping us to understand really to become a little bit conversant in what tort reform entails. And I think you've helped us a great deal today to really, really get that fundamental understanding. So thank you very much for being with us. Nancy, it was terrific as always. Thank you.
Thank you very much for being with us today. Have a wonderful day. Bye. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.